Greetings, New Testament family. We are so excited tonight. We have Pastor John sharing with us a message that God has put on his heart, and Nels has been doing a fantastic job with worship. Uh, things have been going great. All of us are starting to kind of get a little restless. We're looking forward uh, to be able to get together again. But until we do, uh, are able to, I should say, God is using this to connect us again. As you be, begin to watch this video, uh, remember that we're going to take communion together at the end. And so you might want to prepare to receive communion at the end of this message. I want to open us up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather together with these men, knowing that your spirit is with us, God, that you place your anointing upon us, God, that we are not here, Father, to, to, to do anything in, in a way to, to entertain or anything of that, that nature, God. But we are here to submitting ourselves to your spirit, God, asking that you take us, God, just humble men, common men, God, and that you use us, Lord, to speak, Lord, and to speak forth, God, your truth, God. And so we, we're asking for your anointing, God. We just present ourselves as clay vessels, asking, God, that you are glorified in this and that we are led by your spirit to speak your truth. And God, we, we have such a precious family here at New Testament Fellowship. Let many hearts be touched, God, by what you do this day. And we, we just give you gratitude and thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm standing here in your presence In the stillness of your peace Just as I am, you embrace me Just speak the word and I'll be free Healing words, you speak the healing word. Your healing word sets me free. Healing word, you speak the healing word. Your healing word I receive. my hands in sweet surrender your holy presence covers me yours is the voice there is no other and you speak the word that sets me free Healing word, you speak the healing word. Your healing word set me free. Healing word, you speak the healing word. Your healing word, I receive. I'm standing here in your presence In the stillness of your peace Just as I am, you embrace me Just speak the word and I'll be free You speak the healing word Your healing word sets me free Healing word You speak the healing word Your healing word 
I receive in the secret in the quiet place in the stillness dear church family. I've tremendously missed you and in these unprecedented times I have been looking forward to speaking with you and appreciate the opportunity Pastor Doug. Unprecedented times call for a rediscovery of biblical prophecy and that's what I would like to focus on in our time together today rediscovering biblical prophecy. As we begin to get underway today, uh, I'd like to make a distinction between biblical prophecy, what the Apostle Peter called the prophecy of Scripture, and spoken prophecy that we might hear in a church service or through uh, a gifted prophetic ministry. I highly value the spoken prophetic word uh, in our services and through direct um, ministries, but there's no uh, prophet or spoken word that can compare with the prophecy of Scripture. Amen. I uh, heard a national caliber prophet told me once that I, that I know all the national caliber prophets, he said, and the best of them are right about 90% of the time. Can I encourage your heart that in the prophecy of Scripture, the prophecy of Scripture is right 100% of the time. It is never in error. We may misunderstand it. We may misapply it. Amen. But God's speaking into the future uh, is always 
on target, 100% correct and dependable. And if we ever needed a dependable word, especially regarding the future, uh, we need it now. It might be interesting for you to know that 30% of the Holy Scripture, those that have analyzed it, uh, is biblical prophecy. It is a huge, almost a third of the Bible is biblical prophecy. Uh, as sadly, as I might mention in a moment or two, uh, you don't hear too much about biblical prophecy from our pulpits. In fact, I'll go there right now. One study which studied over a thousand evangelical messages found that only 2% of them had to do with biblical prophecy. So we're talking about 30% of the word of God and only 2% of these thousand messages had to do with uh, biblical prophecy. Uh, certainly in our time, we need a rediscovery of the value and the importance of biblical prophecy. Of course, not just to ministers or preachers, but to God's people. So I, uh, here we go. Uh, usually when someone is talking about prophecy in scripture, they'll make a distinction between uh, foretelling and forthtelling or speaking to the future. Now God's forthtelling, he's speaking to a present situation and what I call the near now. Because sometimes he's dealing with something, he's saying something is going to happen. Uh, it may not be instantaneous, but it's right on the horizon. It is going to happen very soon, if not nearly immediately. God's speaking truth and reality into the near now, our present. And there's a significant part of biblical prophecy is foretelling. I'm trying to get my terminology correct here. But foretelling, this is God speaking to the future uh, through human personalities, the, the personalities of the biblical writers. God speaking to the future. It is tremendously relevant to where we are now, and it has always been tremendously relevant, but especially now. And so I'm hoping by God's grace to reignite a desire in your heart to begin to examine the prophetic scripture once again mm -hmm. and to allow God to do his amazing and special work uh, through this portion of his living word. Now, Jesus made a statement once that's just mind boggling. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away. That's the Jewish way of saying the universe will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And Jesus spoke a great deal about what was coming. We may touch on some of these things. And as we'll see as we move forward in today's message, Jesus' personal life was richly informed by the prophetic scripture and things foretold in prophetic scripture. In fact, we've just passed our uh, probably the most different Easter celebration that any of us have ever had over our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I have seen quite a few of them. But on that first resurrection day, Jesus uh, appearing to his uh, initially skeptical and then joyful uh, disciples, showing himself uh, vibrantly alive. And when he had settled the question that he was actually alive and raised from the dead in their minds, he gave them a Bible lesson, and I just want to hit you with a few of these verses. <clears throat> he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and raise, rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. The Lord actually took his disciples through a quick course on biblical prophecy as it pertained to him. And everything he told them that night from the scriptures that was written, 
everything he told them that we have a record of was actually biblical prophecy. And we'll see that the Lord um, tremendously flowed with what God had showed him over the years and was showing him about the things that had to take place uh, in terms of uh, the future. Now, why, did, why does God do this? I heard that we have over 22 million people have filed for unemployment benefits because of the Corona-19 uh, virus. 22 million unemployment claims. It's never happened before, not this fast. And uh, no one knows for sure where it's going to end. And perhaps, you know, you're here in this service, this unusual service, and you're wondering how are you going to go forward if uh, you might lose your job or have lost your job and uh, the moratorium on mortgage payments goes away and how, how are you going to navigate all of this? And for you to be in possession of a hope concerning the future is a tremendously precious gift from God. And Bible prophecy, uh, for those that have received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Bible prophecy serves to give you a hope about certain fixed realities that are not going to change, they're not going to go away, and they will be fulfilled in your future uh, and in the future of God's people. Bible prophecy also serves to give a warning to people that have not yet repented and not yet surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. It's amazing. I was thinking of Noah, my brothers. Mm -hmm. Not Noah, but Jonah. And Jonah is sent reluctantly to Nineveh, and he goes with this amazing message. Uh, in, 40 in 40 days, Nineveh will, be Nineveh will be destroyed. An amazing uh, long message. <laughs> and he walks through this great city of Nineveh with, with that simple message, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That was a prophetic word about the future, the near future. And an amazing thing happened from the king all the way down to the lowest commoner. They repented and the king called for repentance and the people responded and they even put sackcloth on domestic animals. The depth of their repentance was so deep. There was a warning about what was coming and these people repented and heeded. And I don't know where you are today and if, if, um, if things are really up to date with you and God through Jesus Christ, but you can repent by God's grace. You can embrace change and with the Lord's help, enter into a place of hope. I want to, to read you a scripture regarding hope out of uh, First Peter. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is there an amen? <laughs> In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now, before I talk a little bit about hope, I want to say this. Your 401k plan, if you have one, may be dashed to smithereens. Or you may be zipping through your life saving like crazy, paying your bills because you have lost your job. But friends, there is an inheritance for every one of God's children. And actually, we can build on that inheritance. We can build up our rewards. It's beyond the scope of what we have to, time we have to deal with today. But there is an inheritance that no up or down, no virus, no, no change in political setup, communism, socialism, capitalism, Nothing can touch this inheritance that is laid up for you in heaven. It's real. And it is going to be very, very tangible when you cross over. And could it be that part of what God would be doing in this era is refocusing some of our life's priorities and our personal investments? And I'm not thinking of money so much, but how we're investing our actual lives. 
Because if we're in the grip of what the apostle called a living hope, then it changes things for us. Now, hope, a lot of people get a misunderstanding of what we're talking about when the scripture talks about hope. You know, it's kind of like, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I don't get laid off. Uh, you know, it would, it would sure be nice. I, I, uh, I wish it would happen. That is not at all what biblical hope is about. Biblical hope is when God makes a fixed promise about something that is going to happen. Something that is going to happen in the future. We don't know what the timing is. We can't make it happen. Now, faith is a kind of a now thing. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, etc. Hope has to wait. But it's waiting in the certainty that it's coming. And you have a living hope or you can have a living hope if you give your life to Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer, uh, it might be time to rediscover uh, some of the great things that uh, the Lord has laid up in store for us in the realm of the living hope. Now, to move off our preliminary comments and maybe pick up the tempo a little bit, Pastor Nels, uh, Bible prophecy can really help us navigate our present situation. I'm extremely gripped how Jesus at the crisis time or one of the major, probably the major crisis time of his earthly life and ministry was guided and directed by biblical prophecy. Walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, he makes this statement. You're all going to fall away tonight because of me. Because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. In fact, at the near climax of that Garden of Gethsemane thing, I guess it was the climax because Judas had arrived. Jesus had been seized. Peter whips out his sword to try to save the day and Jesus sternly tells him to put it back. And he makes this statement, all of these things, did not the scripture say all of these things had to happen? Mm -hmm. And as Jesus was going through his passion, he was being guided by biblical prophecy and, and faith in the reality that now Biblical prophecy had moved out of the future and into my present speaking of the Savior. You see, here we are as human beings, God's children, hopefully through faith. Mm -hmm. And we're living on this mm, timeline, you know, moving through our life journey. Uh, but whether it's us as an individual or family or whether it's us as a nation of Americans, or whether it's us as God's great people, at some point, biblical prophecy intercepts human history and the future becomes now because it's time for God's fulfillment and he is going to fulfill it. And how our cooperation and our faith in that moment, our submission and flow with it, 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 that is all a, a beautiful and mysterious thing. We can't go into it now. But Jesus was guided and navigated the most intense of situations with biblical prophecy. Now, that wasn't all that he was navigated by, but at the crisis points, he was operating off what he knew God said had to happen, and it was happening now. And I deeply believe that God will allow uh, uh, us to find real help in navigating our life through biblical prophecy. You know, they say uh, one of the principles of interpreting uh, biblical prophecy is there, there are preliminary fulfillments and then there's an ultimate fulfillment. Uh, preliminary fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment. Well, may I suggest to you that there can be a little micro preliminary fulfillment for you out of biblical prophecy that God lets co to come into the now because he is recycling this word in a preliminary way down into your life to help you and guide you and, and give you the uh, resources inner and outer that you need. Biblical prophecy. It's time for us to rediscover it because it can help us 
navigate through life. Amen. Also, Amen. <laughs> also uh, biblical prophecy <clears throat> uh, can help us discern the signs of the times and, and act appropriately. Jesus once upbraided uh, some of the people around him and said, you guys are experts in the weather. The sky is red at night. It's going to be a great day tomorrow. The sky is red and in the morning it's going to be stormy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how is it you can discern the appearance of the sky and you cannot discern the signs of the time? Well, biblical prophecy allows us to have a better grip on discerning the times in which we live. For example, Bill Gates of Microsoft wants you to have a tattoo or a chip implanted in your body or at least to have a certificate of immunity to the COVID-19 virus. What do you think about that? Um, I read in Revelation 13 that there's a mark of the beast coming and it's eternally deadly to take that mark. I'm not saying that this is the mark of the beast, but it could be a preliminary. But we can get a handle on the signs of the time through immersing ourselves in biblical prophecy, and it can help us make the right moves to say no to the right things and yes to the right people as we uh, accurately discern the times. Uh, there's a great scripture, 1 Thess chapter 5, and I'm just going to wing it here, but it, it says basically, you're not in the dark about the signs of times, that these times should overtake you like a thief. You're not in the darkness. You, you have a level of discernment. I praise God, and much of that comes from biblical prophecy. Well, you know, Pastor, as you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5 there, you know, we have this discipline of reading through the Bible every year. And what I found that's uh, done for me in particular, when something takes place, or maybe there's a theological question, I might not always uh, have the answer at that exact moment. But there's this thing inside of me because I've got God's word hidden inside of me. This little gong or this little thing will go off and, and that discerner will start to kick in because, you know, as we're reading, sometimes we're like, what, what does all this mean? But we're not just feeding our mind, we're feeding our spirit. And so kind of to pastor's point, you know, we've got all this biblical prophecy that's stored up within us. And, and when these things begin to take place, it's almost like we begin to get spiritual goosebumps and we begin to realize, hey, because we've read the words of prophecy, we begin to realize something's going on here and the Holy Spirit can take that and make it alive and use it to do the things you're talking about, to, to bring us hope or to guide us through that situation. So it's very important that we don't neglect, particularly this, the biblical prophecy and in favor of other things, that we digest this, that we read it, that we, that we study it so that the Holy Spirit has something to work with when those situations do arise in our lives. Yes. And, and I think, Nils, did you have something to share as far as what Pastor's been uh, speaking to up to this point? Yeah, I was just thinking of the uncertainty of the days that we're living in with the virus. And uh, I mean, if you, you can't hardly turn on the TV without there being just a lot of fear mongering. Right. People are afraid. And I see it in my own family that uh, and the only way to get out of that really is to immerse yourself in the word. Amen. I love immersing myself in the Psalms because they give us great hope, great comfort. It tells us what's going to happen at the end, yes. even though it hasn't happened. And it'll be, be, there will be a day when it happens. And that's the day that we're longing for. So I would just encourage you, if you're having trouble with the fear, turn off the TV and uh, yes. read some Psalms. Get into the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. A lot of prophecy in the Psalms. Yeah. Yes. There's uh, Psalm 56 says, What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Uh -huh. Amen. That's good. Amen. All right. I think it might be uh, helpful just to read those first Thess uh, verses to you, and then we'll uh, shift directions a little bit. <clears throat> Paul had just finished talking about the rapture. Now, when a lot of people hear the phrase, the rapture, they're thinking in terms of the pre-tribulation rapture as uh, greatly and commonly understood. Uh, and there's been a, a lot of fierce opposition to the idea of the rapture. But friends, 
a rapture, whether it's uh, before the tribulation, before the wrath, mm -hmm. after uh, the great wind down of those final uh, years before the Lord establishes his kingdom, a rapture is absolutely irrefutable in the word of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back. We'll read a couple of scriptures along that line. And the scripture actually calls it the blessed hope, mm -hmm. the yeah. glorious appearing Amen. of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, here's 1 Thess 5. <clears throat> I'm going right to the chapter, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we don't need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, so that this day should over surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light, and of the day we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not to be dis surprised by... Uh, developments as God moves the future more closely to the present. The whole concept of the day of the Lord is beyond what we can do today, but maybe sometime we'll talk about it, but you're going to find it in the scripture. So uh, biblical prophecy can also give us a grand ultimate context for our life. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big, big picture about what is actually going to happen to us in the future. And I'm not thinking of what's going to happen next month or if a certain political party is elected or this or that. I'm talking about the big picture. What happens as a believer when your body stops working from COVID-19, coronavirus, or any other factor. Absent from the body, the scripture says, Amen. is to be present with the Lord. Jesus made this statement. He says, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Amen. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Yeah. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That is a statement of uh, one of the ultimates, part of the ultimate context of our life. The scripture says God's going to wipe every tear out of our eyes. That's, he says it more than once in the book of Revelation. That's no big deal if you're carrying sorrow if you're carrying profound disappointment, including disappointment in yourself, but you've been born again through receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's coming a time when the Lord is going to wipe every tear out of your eyes and out of your heart. So it provides this big context. Friends, heaven is real. The scripture says Abraham saw the heavenly city. And I mean, Abraham, in his day, and it would be true to a large extent in our day, was fabulously rich. It didn't affect him at all in terms of what was really important to him because he saw a city and his heart was in that eternal city that we call New Jerusalem. Heaven is real. And the believer in Jesus Christ gets to go there. That's just a glorious part of the big context. You know, we're, we're hearing an awful lot about uh, communist China mm -hmm. and an awful lot about kind of communist China. And sadly, I believe a whole big, huge amount of it is true, uh, including some sad, tragic compromises on the U.S. side of things. I, it's, we're not going to go there any further than that. So the communist revolution sweeps over China and there's a missionary couple there, uh, John and Betty Stam, and they're being led, aw led away to their execution. And the executioner says um, to the Stams, do you know where I'm taking you? And John says, I don't know where you're taking me, but I know where I'm going. Oh, praise God. Wow. What a tremendous statement. When the communist North Koreans swept down over the South, 
uh, their, one of their primary targets was Christian pastors. And a Christian pastor and his family were forced to dig their own grave, get down in the grave, and they were told, um, repudiate your Christianity, deny Christ, affirm our glorious revolution, and you can come up out of that uh, grave and help us make this revolution work. And the children were crying. The husband was very uh, tempted, you know, or tested, you know, by the, the uh, prospect of his family's death. And he was pretty shaky, and his wife said, in effect, honey, steady up. In a few moments, we'll be with Jesus. And they stayed firm and were covered over and, and perished in the natural. They put on a martyr's crown and entered heaven uh, uh, and that great company of martyrs. Praise you God. see, they, they were operating in, with the big context, the ultimate context of their life that is provided by biblical prophecy. Now, what about this? Does God give us biblical prophecy just to kind of stir up our uh, curiosity and give us a lot of cool facts, you know, about the future or whatever? A no. No, he doesn't. God gives us knowledge of the future to give us hope, but also to call us into a way of life, a way of holiness, to be frank, but a way of life that we would want to be living when the future becomes the now. So there's a huge emphasis in biblical prophecy and particularly in the New Testament on making sure, making sure that your life is lining up with the holiness of God and with the character of Jesus Christ. So let me share a few verses with you on this, and then we'll move toward a close of my part of our ministry today. So I, one of my favorites is in 1 John. I'll find 1 John eventually. Okay. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. I'm in 1 John chapter 2. Uh, is it pretty obvious, brothers and sisters, that there are groups, organizations, individuals, some of them with billions of dollars, that are trying to lead God's people astray? Well, he goes on here and says, uh, uh, and I want to I drop down a verse but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in Jesus. And now, dear children, continue in him. One, one translation says, remain united. Remain in fellowship with Christ, another. Another says, stay with Christ. Live deeply in Christ. Uh, the King James says, abide in him. So that when he appears... You may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. That's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we're the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, when Christ appears, when Christ appears, I'm going to read a little more of these verses. Are you, dear friends, looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ? Are you eagerly waiting for the appearing of Jesus Christ? Paul, in talking to the Thessalonians, makes this statement. You turn from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, Jesus, who saves us from the wrath to come. Are you eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back? This is a serious question. So we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. 
Peter, oh, an amazing, amazing uh, uh, series of verses. And um, Peter, Second Peter talks an awful lot about the last days, an awful lot. Uh, and uh, he says, for example, verse 10 of chapter 3, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The heavens, the elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So then, dear friends, he says, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Are we looking forward? Are we gripped enough by biblical prophecy that we're not just looking at COVID-19 and the unemployment numbers and, and, and this, that, or the other uh, in our natural situation, but are we looking forward to the return of the Lord? And I, I, I I'll say this, uh, Paul had to work real hard to try to build unity in the churches that he had founded and worked on. It was, it was an ongoing struggle. And one problem was one brother criticizing another brother, you know, and passing judgment on another brother and this kind of thing. And he says in Romans 14, who are you to judge another man's servant? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We'll all give an account of ourselves to God. This is for born-again Christians that are living in grace, that have been saved by grace. Our life will be reviewed, and we will be rewarded for everything that can be rewarded and everything that cannot be. Uh, I don't know how the Lord will speak to it, but we're forgiven. It's not an issue of heaven or hell for a born-again believer, but we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Scripture says that we may receive that which is done in the body, whether it's good or bad. So there's a tremendous call for us in light of future certainties, in light of the hope that we embrace to start living like citizens of heaven, Amen. like actual children of God, like members of the family of the Lord. I understand, and from personal experience, that our flesh is very real. It can trip us up. We fail. Sometimes we fail habitually. And there is grace, and there is forgiveness, and there is help, and there is direction, and there is strength from the Lord. But we dare not let go of the idea that the Lord is returning. We will give an account. We want to be with him, and uh, we're seeking him for grace, you know, to... Be like him, actually. So a final scripture uh, out of Titus. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed because my pastor's watching me fumble looking for these scriptures. <laughs> oh, well, praise yeah. the Lord. This is Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. I got to stop here just for a moment. God is offering you salvation if you've not given your heart to Christ. It is the most amazing offer. Total forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed and entrance into that eternal kingdom and the eternal city where he lives. All through faith, repentance and faith in Christ. Repentance basically meaning you're ready to change, you're ready to go his way. And faith in what Jesus has done Amen. at Calvary and beyond. What an offer, brothers. Amen. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify 
for, uh, for himself a people who are his very own, eager to do good works. So uh, biblical prophecy crunches down in part to a call from a loving heavenly father, a great savior who spent everything for us, a call to make an upward journey in terms of our moral uh, and personal life, inwardly, outwardly, especially inwardly, but also outwardly. Um, the Lord is coming back. He's coming back. And he sits as the chief executive officer of the universe, all authority in heaven and earth given to Jesus Christ. We belong to him if we have been born again. And you can give yourself to him right now if you've never really made that ultimate decision to give yourself to Jesus. Biblical prophecy, I believe in the light, my brothers, my sisters, in the light of these unprecedented times, it is time to rediscover biblical prophecy Amen. and begin to live in the light of it as we have never had before. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, Pastor, I think that was a great message. Yes, and, and I think we should just go ahead and jump into communion right now based off uh, the spirit of what's been spoken. You know, the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you know, Paul is speaking and he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And it says, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so this bread represents the body of Jesus. He was our, he was our substitute at the cross. The punishment that we deserve was placed upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. The Bible talks about healing in the stripes of Christ. And as we partake of this bread in just a... a a minute or two, if you need healing in your body, you can receive healing in faith. Whatever you need, as Pastor has taught us in the past, whatever you need, we find in Jesus Christ. But also, uh, the Bible says this, in the same way after supper, he also took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. And so we, are, we have entered into a covenant with God through Jesus Christ because his blood was shed for us. We, we enter into a covenant and we are reaffirming our commitment to Christ and we are declaring what he did for us at the cross. There's something very powerful, a special grace that takes place uh, during this time of communion. So as you're there preparing, be prepared for a special grace of God to enter into your heart and your soul as we consider what Christ did for us at the cross. And to Pastor's point, it says, Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, Pastor, to your point, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He comes, and he's coming again. And your points were so wonderful. The hope that we have how it prepares us. We're not caught unawares. And also the idea that uh, we're going to be standing in front of him. And this it spurs us on in a grace-filled way mm -hmm. to desire to live holy lives. Family, if there's anything in your heart that the Holy Spirit is convicting you over right now, in addition to seeking healing from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're also seeking to, to live to a higher plane, to want to now be like Christ and live as Christ would live in all facets of life. And so if the Holy Spirit convicts you over any sin, right now would be a great opportunity just to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Because what happens is in the act of confession, you're acknowledging the truth and grace is released to, get, to give you the strength to walk in holiness. And so we take this bread, which is precious, the body of Jesus Christ. We repent of our sins. We seek your healing. We receive your grace. Jesus, you are precious. We receive this bread, your body, 
Yes, Lord. Take and eat. Amen. Your message last week on grace and truth really fits in with this because when that prophecy of the end time intersects with the present, yes. the time of grace and truth ends. That's the period that we're in now. We're in a period of grace and truth where if you have not turned to the Lord, you can do so. Now is the time to do it. The cost for that was his precious blood and was his body. We, uh, we encourage you to seek the Lord while he may be found Amen. if you have not done so. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the blood that was shed, for your body that was given, Lord. Yes. Uh, again, Lord, we drink this cup in remembrance of you and we anticipate the day of your return. Take and drink. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Brother Nels, can you close us out with a song? Yeah, I decided I'm going to sing a song that you might not have, might not know. I, I haven't sung it in a while, but I think I can do it. It's Zephaniah 317, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Oh, hallelujah. Let's see. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, he will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. He will rest in his love, he will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, he will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. He will rest in his love, he will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest love he will rest in his love he will joy over thee with singing he will rest in his love he will rest in his love he will joy over thee with singing he will rest in his love he will rest in his love he will joy over thee with singing hallelujah oh glory <laughs> thanks Nels. you're welcome mm -hmm. Praise God. Bless you all. Amen. This certainly has been a, a special time, and I'm going to ask Pastor if you'll put a blessing over our church family as we close out our service today. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Our Father in heaven. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Through our precious Savior. Yes. Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, Son of David, Son of man. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless your people. You are their shepherd, Lord Jesus. They shall not want Amen. according to your word. Mm -hmm. Father, Amen. you are their shepherd. Jesus, you are their shepherd. And I bless them with an increased sense of your presence in their daily life. Lord, may they learn, may I learn, may we learn to dwell more fully in the secret place, yes, to abide in Christ to confess that he is our shield uh, and our fortress, yes. to set our love upon him. Father, I bless your people now. Yes. Keep them safe, totally safe, and bless them in this wonderful, amazing season. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Till we meet again, God bless you, church amen. family.